So it is my honor and privilege to, to introduce this uh, fourth, fourth, fifth, uh, first seminar of the year. And we have the pleasure to receive someone that we know well, Federica Rousseau, that will discuss uh, uh, about on the epistemic and normative benefits of methodological pluralism. And after her talk, we will have a small five minute break. And after uh, one of our own, Juliette Ferry Danini, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, Juliette, name on me, will start the discussion with the group. So you have the floor. Thank you very much for having me here again. I guess the last time was uh, five years ago. Yeah, time flies. And for me, it is always a pleasure to come back. It feels like a coming back home because I spent very many years in this building. So there is always kind of an emotional thing uh, coming back in a different uh, uh, role. But there we go. Um, I would like to talk about uh, methodological pluralism. Um, I'm going to argue that uh, not only um, the fact that we have a plurality of methods in use in the sciences, but also that it is a good thing that we have this uh, uh, plurality of methods. And if anything, we should really fight to uh, keep this uh, uh, plurality. That's really kind of the core of, uh, uh, of the argument. To uh, build my argument for methodological pluralism, first I would like to make a shift in, uh, in focus, something that has to do with uh, philosophical methodologies especially. And so to say that uh, um, to appreciate uh, why it matters that we um, acknowledge this plural plurality of methods, we need to turn our attention to the practice of the sciences. So I will explain what this uh, practice shift uh, entails, because the background of this is um, a more traditional mode of doing philosophy of science, where we ask questions such as, what is a theory? What is a model? What is an explanation? And then this seems insufficient until we really look at what happens in the practice, and from this, then to restart uh, um, the discussion on uh, methods. I will uh, introduce uh, briefly two episodes of what I call techno science, just to illustrate uh, how different methods may be at work uh, in different areas and within uh, a same area. And then uh, the, the second part of the talk will be to uh, present my argument for methodological pluralism um, in a first stage of pretty uh, descriptive in character and especially building on the work of uh, hacking and Rufi. And then the second part goes more normative, trying to explain why this is important to counteract forms of methodological imperialism instead. And I will try to explain why I think normatively and epistemically this is something we should really pay attention to. All right, so let me start then with the techno scientific uh, practices. I would like to keep here the techno scientific because a lot that goes on in the examples that I will uh, use also depends on the use of technologies, but I'm not going to, to spend a lot of time on the technologies this time. Instead, it is going to be more about the idea of shifting focus from the concept of method or of model to the practice uh, itself. So, uh, for those of us who have been trained in this uh, more traditional mode of uh, uh, philosophy of science, what is really common is to uh, ask questions about what is a theory, what is an explanation, and this has occupied a large part of the debate in philosophy of science in the past 50, 60, 70 plus uh, years. And, uh, Instead, if we start uh, not looking at uh, the, the specific question of what, what a model is, but how scientists use models and methods, then the whole discourse uh, is likely to change. Now, this is not uh, uh, just rephrasing the question in different terms. It is really a question of philosophical methodology, and this is for the following uh, reason. If you keep asking the question, what is a model or what is a method, if you would like to be even more general, then most likely you will be trying to provide a definition of, of this and a definition that also holds a certain level of generality. 
okay? And uh, as we have been trained in this Anglo-American way of doing philosophy of science, it means that it doesn't matter what the scientists do. It matters, it matters what us philosophers are able to provide as a definition of, okay? And this can work in abstraction of the practice. Now, what has happened as well is that many of these traditional philosophy of science questions have been set up in the context of the natural sciences. And this is where you start having these kind of clashes because what is a theory, what is a model, the majority of people will have in mind models and methods and theories from, say, physics, and then struggle to understand how these things apply, say, to a social science domain or to biology or to a domain that is not the one that we inherited at the most legitimate ones from post-positivism kind of uh, areas. But you may get to very different answers if you pay attention to the practice of what happens. The problem is, the moment you try to look at the practice, uh, there isn't just one way of, uh, of doing it. And looking at the literature, and not just in philosophy of science, but broadening the scope to also science and technology studies and philosophy of technology, then it won't take a lot of time to realize that there are at least three different practice terms that you may have to deal with. The first one is possibly the most famous one, the one in science and technology studies that is mostly associated with laboratory studies where we focus on science as practice. And in this area, people have been trying to show why contemporary practice matters and not just a kind of the historical reconstruction of these practices. And here, clearly, the big hero is Bruno Latour, really kind of going to the labs and understanding what happens and reconstructing these uh, dynamics. Large part of his work and of collaborators and also of the people that came after him is really um, ethnography, sociology of science. And if you extend a bit what they have been done, the, there is also this uh, flattening of epistemology and ontology. They are basically the same thing. And so the social and the reality are kind of on the same level. But the way we have to study them is really kind of being part of this uh, uh, process. Okay? And clearly for us in philosophy of science, this, this may be quite uh, difficult because for one thing, we are not trained to do this type of ethnographic work, but also because we have been used to have this distance, you know, also this, this way of conceptualizing things in abstraction of the practice. At the same time, in philosophy of science, in the past 15 years, we have seen also this movement. In part, and this actually started earlier than the past 15 years, is a new experimentalism with uh, authors such as uh, Cartwright, Gallison, etc., trying to say we have to analyze experiments not just because of their role in establishing theory X, but also because of the materiality that they carry with them. And this is part of a philosophy of science uh, discourse. But also, the, uh, this attention to the, to the practice has been proposed by the, philosophy, uh, the, the Society for Philosophy of Science in Practice. And this has uh, been perceived in the beginning as a bit of a tension, you know, because if the philosophy of science is not looking at the practice, what it is that they are really looking at? But it is interesting, and this is a more of a sociological point, to see how the philosophy of science in practice has really... Uh, grown over the years. It is now an, an important and established place for discussion for philosophers of science. And it has become also a dominant um, part of philosophy of science associations proper, such as the European Philosophy of Science Association or the um, uh, American counterpart. So something has happened in, uh, in philosophy of science too. And at the same time, philosophy of technology 
as we've also seen this shift to the practice because a part of the philosophy of technology has been really about understanding the nature of artifacts and this in, in abstraction of how we come to have this artifact. So there has been also there some pressure to say we have to look at the design process. It is not just about the nature of this artifact, it is also about the practice of engineering. So this is to say, all in all, that uh, the attention to the practice is something that has really come from different uh, quarters. Um, it does call for a lot of self-reflection at the level of philosophical methodology. And I would like to argue that here too, it is already an early moment in which we have to say we have to be pluralist, that it shouldn't be just one way in which we look at practices. If you just want to focus on philosophy of science, possibly the, the author that has, uh, one author that has spent a lot of time and attention to uh, making this shift is Azok Chang, in part because he has tried to show that we need to do history and philosophy of science together because we have to understand how even the kind of the uh, most um, um, what we take for granted right now uh, is the product of uh, intellectual struggles and you have to be able to reconstruct these struggles over time. But the way in which you do it is really carrying out an activity-based analysis. This is probably not very, very readable uh, at the bottom. We don't need all the details, but I'm going to give you some elements. He's focusing on activities, so what is being done um, in the practice in question, but also the aims. So we may want to look at the inherent purposes of the activity, but also whether there is some external function of these activities. We have to look at practice or even better said, at systems of practices in the plural, already introducing an element of pluralism, we have to look at the agents. And this is very important with respect to this traditional mode of philosophy philosophy of science, because we usually talk about the theory, the model, the explanation, but never about the scientist, the explainer, the modeler, who are these people? The, the attention to the people has been the object and or attention of sociology and ethnography of science, but not of philosophers. But if we follow Chang, then understanding who the agents are is also part of the philosophy and history of science discourse uh, proper. We have to, to understand the capabilities of what we are able to do with these uh, systems of practices, which may entail also discussing the uh, um, available techno-scientific equipment uh, at, available at any given time, freedom of choices. I mean, the list is long. What I think is important here is that uh, this is a very useful uh, list of aspects of practices we may want to um, pay attention to. I take Chang in no way to say that every single paper that we want to write has to pay attention to all these, all these aspects simultaneously. So it is also a way of saying it is part of uh, um, our job to say, this is the perspective I take now. This is the angle that I take now. This is why it is important for me to analyze more the equipment, more the agents, more the theoretical level, more the background. And then what happens is that what you see that really cuts across all these lists is conceptual, normative, historical, sociopolitical elements. I find it very important because for one thing, it does help us uh, get the STS uh, approach proper closer to a philosophy of science proper and also closer to other fields such as philosophy of technology, but also ethics of science, which is kind of uh, finally also on the agenda of philosophers of science. And so we can see how these questions are really um, intertwined. Now, with this... Uh, um, theoretical background and with this uh, proposed shift to attention to the practices, let me introduce uh, briefly two episodes uh, of, of techno-scientific practices 
um, cases that I have been studying for a while for various reasons, but here they help me illustrate the variety of methods that are at work. And I chose them from very different fields also to signal that it is not an accident that we find these uh, um, instances of pluralism just in one area. It is quite pervasive. The first episode that I would like to talk about is uh, exposure research. This is uh, a field uh, part of uh, epidemiology and especially in the field of molecular uh, epidemiology. It is an area in which they, um, as epidemiologists, they, were, they are still interested in understanding the relation between exposure and disease. The way in which they are going to study exposure really is different from the traditional epidemiology uh, setup. For one thing, they increase the level of uh, statistical power and of analysis because they are dealing with very large data set, combining them from a different cohort uh, across Europe and, uh, and beyond. Um, so they, there, there has been a lot of work at the level of statistical modeling. At the same time, they have also uh, they have reanalyzed available biospecimens and collecting new ones. So what you have here is uh, two things really. One is methods for uh, collecting, storing, uh, transferring these biospecimens. Methods for the analysis of biospecimens, and then transforming these analyses into numbers that feed. Uh, the statistical analysis that I mentioned just a moment uh, before, and these things are intertwined. All this uh, is possible only if you at the same time develop theories. For instance, if you suspect that um, the type of disinfectant used in the waters of a swimming pool may have an effect on some type of disease, and you want to collect biosamples to check this, how are you going to check this? You know, what is the biological theory that tells you that um, the chlorine that you use in the swimming pool will be um, visible in your body two hours, three hours, 24 hours after you have been in the swimming pool, okay? So you see here that there is an element of iteration of making an experiment, having some hypothesis, it doesn't go well, you develop theory, theory tells you something, you go back. Problem is, we don't have infinite possibilities of uh, uh, collecting all these samples, but you see how here again you have an element of by the end, uh, kind of go back and forth between the theory and the experiment and the statistical methods. Um, they also use simulations. Of course, they've been relying on meta-analysis. The list could go on. And what I'm saying here somehow makes a, a summary of what has happened in some projects that are large consortia, but also across uh, several projects and in larger consortia, but also in a single study. What I just mentioned, like the, the waters in the swimming pool, is like, it's called the Piscina study. Uh, it's one of the famous ones that they have used, for instance. The other example that I want to use uh, comes from a computational history of ideas. And I like to talk about this one uh, because we tend to think that this question about uh, methodological pluralism is something that happens in the labs. Okay, and so this gives me an interesting contrast because here we are really talking about humanities, hardcore humanities that are at the same time really at the forefront of innovating how you do methodology in a proper humanity, humanities context. Um, I've been following very, very closely the work of my colleagues in Amsterdam, especially Arianna Beth in, in her series of projects. And what they do in computational history of ideas is um, um, doing a uh, history of ideas, so understanding one concept and how this concept has changed across time or in large uh, corpora. And what they have done is not just enlarging the corpora thanks to the digitalization of the texts. 
Certainly, this is part of what they have done, and this is part of their methodology. So already getting at producing this corpora, but also they have been using simultaneously methodologies for text parsing and text mining, um, close reading. Um, they have been uh, developing ontologies and software to analyze this. And so, and at the same time, also a theoretical framework. For instance, all the work of Arianna Betty and colleagues relies on a particular concept of concept that I don't have to go in, into this, but this is what they have been using to set up the algorithm that would do the searches on this uh, uh, corpora. But what I think is important to note is that one does not replace the other, and so they have been really using both the computational methods and the traditional uh, close reading, and this to get different types of understanding and of insight into a given concept. Okay, so hopefully this gives you again an idea of how in the same field and even in the same project and even in the same study, you never have to do with just one method. I don't, I, I really struggle to find uh, an area where this is the case, that it is so mono-methodological. And then you can say, well, this is just a, um, a descriptive uh, claim. And uh, yes, the first step of my argument is uh, just descriptive, to say um, we have to acknowledge this. This is what happens, shifting the attention to the practice and to the practices. This is kind of the, the picture that we get in front of us, a plurality of methods in the sciences, across disciplines, in the same field, in a single uh, research project uh, and domain. And now you could say, uh, are you happy with that? Uh, no, I think I'm only halfway through because just recognizing that there is a plurality of methods at work um, is, not, uh, is not enough. As philosopher, we may want to make something out of this uh, description. And this is where my, my second part uh, begins. I want to be able to say why it is important, uh, a good thing, to have this plurality of methods and why we should um, really preserve this, uh, uh, this diversity. And uh, I will be looking into epistemic reasons for why we need to preserve this diversity. And to make this argument, I'm going to rely mainly on the work of uh, Crombie Hacking and uh, Rufi. Um, and then there are also more normative-oriented considerations. And for this, I want to look into um, uh, the, the debate on methodological imperialism uh, instead. So this is where the argument makes a, a very strong um, normative shift. Um, so the crummy hacking styles of reasoning, maybe many of you will be familiar with this or will have heard about the styles of reasoning. It is pretty much a topos, especially in, uh, in the more STS-oriented uh, uh, literature. And most people know it because uh, hacking made them famous, but actually this comes from Crummy before hacking and hacking uh, built on that. Again, oh, this is more visible than the, the, uh, the, the one before. So. We have here uh, seven styles that have been um, identified. One that they call a method of postulation that you can pretty much identify with Greek mathematics, experiments, hypothetical construction of analogical models, comparison and taxonomic reasoning, statistics and probability, historical derivation of genetic development, and then lab practices to isolate and purify uh, phenomena. Uh, and by this, uh, um, hacking means actually something more specific than the two, so experiments, <coughs> but, okay. Um, if you don't take this uh, too, too rigidly, then you see how a number of these uh, have been uh, in place uh, in uh, the two episodes that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, experiment, in some part also the method of postulation, because some element of axiomatization could be present in a computational history of ideas, hypothetical construction and analogical models. The whole of uh, molecular epidemiology is built on that because uh, they can't do otherwise. Statistics and probability all the way, you know. 
historical derivation of genetic development, depending on how you understand this, but there is a, an element really of um, the, also the development of the methods themselves that you may want to uh, consider. So here what is uh, important to bear in mind is what you can do with these types. So for one thing, what you should really refrain from is to try to give precise definitions of each style. This is clearly not what people like hacking were uh, after. Because if you try to pin down exactly, you know, this is the label, this is the definition, this is uh, the category of methods, you kind of fall back into the trap of analytic philosophy. And this is not what is going to, to help you in understanding the practices. So the point is they do not correspond to crystallized methods. There, are, there isn't such a thing as a crystallized method. Instead, this is to point that methods change across time and disciplines. So when we say statistics and probability, you can say, oh, but this is very vague. Yes, it is very vague. And in fact, the way in which statistics and probability methods are used across fields does change the assumption, the specific statistical methods, but that's okay. That is exactly what you have to specify whenever you look at one practice in, in detail. Also, they are often used in combination. And this is an important element to, to recognize because, again, these styles of reasoning do not uh, work in isolation. So the, the uh, very um, sophisticated statistical analysis used in molecular epidemiology are not independent of the, the conceptualization of health and disease and of this way of understanding exposure and also of the type of data that they manage to generate and analyze, etc. So you see that these things are interconnected. And also, these methods really undergo ups and downs in their success of, of use. And this is very interesting, not only historically and sociologically, but also philosophically, because then you can see how methods have been traveling from one field uh, to another. Um, you can see why uh, certain approaches to mathematical modeling, now they are really on the rise in finance, for instance. Uh, why are mathematicians employed in banks, uh, you know? Well, it is because these things travel to some extent. And so uh, we have to be open to the idea that a method that has been um, designed for some specific area at some point may make it into another area for better or for worse. And I will discuss uh, um, later uh, the example of randomized controlled trials as well. You know, and how they have been, they have become uh, the methodology for establishing causal relations. But from a descriptive point of view, um, they have been traveled from one area to, uh, to another. So this is how one has to think about the, the styles. Um, it is not just descriptive. Hacking has uh, four theses about the styles. Um, one is that we have to focus on what these styles allows us to achieve. For instance, introducing new objects of studies, new laws, new explanations. So again, not about crystallizing, this is the style and that's it. But what can we do with this style now that is used in this way rather than uh, another? Um, also, this has to do with what you are able to establish as true or false, depending on the styles, you know? And this is what may help us um, uh, reframe some of the discussions. Do we always need experimental evidence to establish causal claims here and there or not? It depends. So you can see what you are able to establish given a style, but also given the research question you are interested in. And so the way in which they stabilize uh, may be different, and we cannot expect all of these styles to follow the same path. We have to be open to these differences. But finally, 
the other important point is that styles are grounded in our cognitive capacities. And I like this point because it connects to one of the elements of Chang, paying attention to uh, the agents. These styles do not fall from the sky and then we just use them, but maybe they are also a product of what we are able to do at any one given time, and this may change. Um, and these cognitive capacities have somehow uh, intellectual components, but also very much embodied components, sociocultural <coughs> components, and we have to be prepared to um, look at these uh, nuances. The work of uh, Stephanie Ruffi, I find it uh, very interesting because uh, um, it builds on hacking, but it goes uh, significant, significantly uh, further than this. Um, as I read it, the work of hacking uh, remains, after all, uh, descriptive about these styles qua epistemologies, but Rufi, with the idea of foliated pluralism, tries to do something more. She tries to, do, to, to say something about uh, ontology, but let me make a step back. She builds on the styles of reasoning, and then she has uh, three specific theses she wants to argue for with this uh, uh, idea of foliated pluralism. One idea is of transdisciplinarity. A style of reasoning does not belong to one discipline or domain only. You know, sounds like a platitude, but it is important uh, to, uh, to have it clear uh, uh, on the table. And then you see that statistical analysis will be a, an excellent case in point here. They do not belong to one field. They are really used across fields. Non-exclusiveness and synchronicity. Several styles of reasoning can be combined at any given moment or in any given uh, study. Of course, uh, it takes quite a lot of work to argue for the legitimacy or the plausibility of this combination, but this is what we, what we actually uh, do. And then the cumulativeness. The use of multiple styles of reasoning leads to enlarging the basket of styles rather than superseding one of them. And this is where it starts getting interesting. You know, it is not just cumulative in the sense that now we have more, the, the previous one gets off the list and then I have another one and there is an element of a kind of linear progression. Not at all. It is much messier than, uh, than that. Um, sometimes even for the worse, perhaps, because we are making things more complicated, less clear, and uh, a good case in point here would be uh, opaque AI models that are nested as they are used in climate science. There is this element of cumulativeness, and as a result, we don't know the elements in between, and then we have a result, and we have no idea how we got to it. But that's what it is. But what do we do really with this? This is the, the interesting point about ontology that I take uh, from, uh, from uh, Rufi. The reason why we need this pluralism is because with different methods, we enrich the ontological space of whatever we study. So the idea here of using styles in combination is not equivalent to triangulation. The idea of triangulation has been used in a number of fields to say, if I get to this result in this study and in this study and in this study, they converge and the result must be true. But that's not what uh, we are trying to understand with uh, foliated pluralism. The idea is that if you study a scientific object through a statistical analysis, through a qualitative study, through a simulation, through an experiment, what you get is actually epistemic access to an object that is multi-layered complex in itself. And so you get some of it from different angles and perspectives. Of course, you can say, and how do I reconcile them? That's exactly the, the, the beauty and the complexity of the sciences, right? The beauty and the complexity of the sciences, right? But to just argue that one method will give you the one privileged entry point into the scientific object, from the perspective of Rufi, is to misunderstand the nature of a scientific object in itself. There isn't just one thing out there to which we get access. In part, if you want, this is pretty much in line with STS arguments for a form of construction constructivism, but I would like to argue more for forms of 
constructionism, perspectivism, and we can discuss this uh, uh, later. But the point is, it is really about having more um, of the ontology rather than less. Now, two examples that I would like to use to illustrate how this foliated pluralism may work in practice are the following. One is the use of uh, mixed methods research in the social sciences. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with mixed methods research, but already the label indicates that the nature of these class of methodologies is to use quantitative and qualitative methods in a single uh, study. There is no hierarchy. There are various ways in which the uh, qualitative and qual quantitative methods may be combined. There is a rich literature and debate within this field also to come up with protocols uh, for this type of questions it is better to do first qualitative than quantitative or the other way around or in a different uh, iteration form etc if you are interested in qualitative um, um, QCA, uh, compa qualitative comparative analysis, in a, is a very interesting subset. I mention it because you have a star of QCA here, the UCL, and it is Benoit Liu from the social sciences, one person that has been really pushing the agenda of this methodology and for the um, pluralistic uh, uh, nature of this methodology. And so the question is, what each method gives us information about and this is exactly what you have to justify in the setup of your study, but also in the conclusion. Why to study a certain problem, you would go qualitative first and quantitative next or the other way around. What it is that you are getting from studying qualitative and quantitatively, this is exactly what we have to explain, what we have to justify, not to claim that the privileged entry point would be, say, just the quantitative because numbers will give us the truth kind of thing. Another example that I want to, to give to illustrate um, this, uh, the idea of defoliated pluralism is evidential pluralism that uh, has been discussed extensively in medical methodology now uh, because by and large medical methodology and especially evidence-based medicine um, has tried to sell the idea that randomized controlled trials will tell us the truth about um, interventions and their effectiveness. And there has been a very rich literature coming from philosophy of science to show that, first of all, it is not true that a randomized control trial is just a randomized control trial. It encapsulates a lot of information that comes from biology, social science, evidence of mechanisms. So even if you want to sell it as this is pure statistics, and just with the statistical test, I pin down the, the relations, this is not true. So a proper philosophy of science exercise should show that it is inherently pluralistic, the RCT methodology. But secondly, that you have to go even a step further and consider other types of evidence that you may use alongside the one that is generated by RCT. A good place to look for this would be the methodology of the, um, of the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, uh, especially in their preamble, where they are really trying to see how different baskets may give you different types of evidence and then collectively, or in the amalgamation, may lead you to how you classify a given carcinogens. Okay? The metaphor that has been used to explain um, Evidential pluralism is that of reinforced concrete. For those who know a bit of engineering, reinforced concrete has really two elements, the concrete but also the steel, and why it works better because the two materials perform better under different types of stress. And so it is together that they are better, not in isolation, and they actually in a very complementary way. All right. This looks like a beautiful uh, story. We should all be happy and uh, a happy family of a methodological pluralist. But I think what the, um, what the reality is, uh, is that uh, um, it is a battlefield. And I very much dislike these uh, war metaphors uh, in philosophy and elsewhere. But I think it is fair to say that 
methodology in the sciences is a place where uh, the game is played. And it is a constant attempt to impose one method over the other and also across uh, disciplines. Um, there is um, a subfield now in philosophy of science that is uh, uh, dedicated to uh, the study of these imperialistic uh, cases. In some cases, uh, uh, scholars have shown that uh, um, it has begun as a healthy case of genuine interdisciplinary uh, exchange. Eminent examples are economics and the neuroscience, but then at, this, at some point, you know, one method tends to take over and flatten uh, anything else that is used um, in peripheral areas of, of the field. And RCT is another good example. Uh, the way in which uh, the um, um, Authority, authorities, um, governments have been pushing for using RCTs in the social sciences or in domains such as education. You can also see it as a case of uh, imperialism. But why is it uh, bad? Okay. I'm going to give you two examples to illustrate why it is bad uh, and hopefully convince you that we should really try to avoid these cases. One example that I have comes really from the social sciences and especially uh, sociology. Um, there has been a very interesting um, controversy uh, published in a prominent social science journal that originated in a study of uh, uh, Bukhodi and Goldthorpe. Goldthorpe is a very famous sociologist uh, um, based in the UK. And what they did was um, a study on social class returns due to higher education observational study, trying to understand not so much how much more people would earn if they, they had a higher education, but what would the return be in terms of social class. And in the same journal that had been a very harsh critique to say, uh, look, this is not good because your study was observational, you didn't use potential outcome models. Potential outcome models are a special type of statistical models that are based on the idea of uh, counterfactuals and so in a sense also experimental. But especially, they are used to study the effects of causes. So you think you know what the causes are and then you try to establish what the effects are. Okay? And their reply was, your critique is not quite right because my question was about causes of effect. Also, the whole theoretical setup and the data I had were not well suited to use potential outcome models. I really needed more traditional observational studies. And this has gone on for a couple of replies, etc. So you can see here the pressure. A study that in and of itself, you say, oh, that's actually pretty good. It's solid, well conducted, well run, blah, blah, blah. It is attacked at the level of methodology and not because they say, you have not done things right in this method, but to say you should have used this method because this method is inherently superior to that one. You see the problem? Now you can say, oh, come on, this is a quarrel. Maybe this Voltor did not get along with this other guy, Clark, and you know it is a self-contained thing. I think that what goes on in this kind of quarrels is prepared by other types of imperialistic forms. And the second example I have comes from epidemiology this time. Uh, so the two are effectively disconnected, but you can see how one may lead to the other down the road. So what has happened is that uh, it was probably 2014, World Congress of Epidemiology and uh, plenary uh, speech of the president, Miguel Hernan, who is a very prominent epidemiologist and one of those who has been working decades to promote the use of this causal inference approach in epidemiology, which is this potential outcome that I just uh, mentioned, essentially. And the thing is, he clearly said black and white in the uh, plenary speech, but also in his publications, causal questions are well-defined when interventions are well-defined. And this is the method to be used in epidemiology. Now, what do you do about ethnicity? What do you do about social class? 
what do you do about gender, you know? So epidemiology, demography, many of the social sciences take interest in these types of variables, but go figure how you can have a well-defined intervention on gender, race, ethnicity. Okay, so what do you do? Either you say these are not causes, or you say whatever you do will never reach the standards of, you know, and make it into the realm of the good science. You see why this is uh, dangerous, a dangerous move to make. Um, yeah. Uh, just a question about the, the protection of criminals. Yeah. Is it just for stratification? I mean, can't you afterwards just resample and assume your, your whole population is, say, female and can become a threshold experiment? Yes, you could do that. But it also depends on the kind of question that you are interested in. The, um, the potential outcome model and any elaboration of it will work nicely if you are interested in understanding effects of causes, not the causes of effects. So you try to establish what would be the effect of having a certain type of higher education, and then you restratify, you do matching strategies. There is a lot that you can do, fine. But in some cases, you are not interested in kind of having the causes fixed and see what happens down the road, you have uh, you know, a data set and you want to understand what may be the causes of this. So what you hold fixed, so to speak, is the effect. And then you try to reconstruct using certain methodologies what the causes are. If this is your question, then no matter how you refine and you adapt to the data, the potential outcome model, it is simply the, the method that is ill-suited to your question. So to say that it is the, this, the, the approach that allows you to be scientific um, is, is premised on the, on the wrong idea. That is the point. But you are right. There is a lot that you can do in the follow-up also to adapt to the type of data that you have. But I think what you are asking is a slightly different concern. OK. Let me get to the final point about um, epistemic diversity. Why is this a good thing? It is a good thing because methodological pluralism, it is not just about more methods. Uh, it is also about having more voices. And so it is very much in line uh, with feminist epistemologies and for the need of enlarging scope of admissible and legitimate voices and, and of standpoints. Okay, the two things really uh, go together. I haven't, I don't have hard numbers, but I think it is not difficult to imagine that these methodological mainstream are also mainstream that have kind of specific connotations in terms of uh, the uh, who is doing the science. And so the, the point about epistemic diversity is that it is good for methodological reasons, epistemological and normative because we really need these different points to get a better understanding, uh, or at least different understandings that we have to try and confront with. And I'm closing now. So clearly, questions of methods are at the core of philosophy of science. They, they have always been and they will uh, remain. How to ask questions of methods may, however, make a difference. So there is here an interesting point to be made about how you want to ask questions about methods. And the way in which I tried to ask again questions of methods was from a specific practice uh, perspective. So shifting the focus to the practice, uh, to me, makes it super visible that Multiple methods are used across fields, in a single field, in a single study. And then from this descriptive claim, I've been trying to give reasons for why this is um, a good thing that we have, the, uh, the methodological pluralism. Uh, for one thing, it has to do with understanding also the um, what we study, the scientific object, as a multi-layered uh, and complex -ish kind of object. And this is the reason why it is in need of multiple methods. But also, and this is where it goes more normative, it may have bad effects on the practice of science and introduce mainstreams or kind of constraints 
that are normatively bad. And this is where I would like to make a link with the usual uh, claim of feminist epistemology about positionality and the need of different voices and so on and so forth. Um, if you want to know more about how I am locating um, methodological pluralism, um, this is where you get kind of the full story, the attention to the practices and uh, how this has also effect on how we think of truth, knowledge, evidence, um, etc. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> Let us now take a five minute break before the general discussion. So, see you in five.
So now let me give the floor to Juliette Ferry Dany that will start the discussion by a comment of the talk of Federica Rousseau. Okay, so I'm not really going to do my comments. I'm just going to ask two big questions. Um, so thank you for sending me the chapter in the plans. But I'm going to focus on what you, the question of the talk. So first is about this, uh, what I understand from your chapter, but also this talk, is that pluralism is good, right? And imperialism is bad. And in a way, I agree, and uh, this is going to be me trying to, 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 because I'm not sure exactly why I'm in an uncomfortable position when I, 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 I listen to you talking about that. Uh, because if, do you think um, there are cases where imperialism could be good and fruitful and could even protect uh, knowledge from some harmful practices? Uh, because if the metaphor is war, uh, then it could be that are good wars or just wars or you know, not just bad imperialistic wars and so on. Uh, and I'm thinking in, in some instances in medicine where uh, you know, I feel like there are cases that we can think about where you have this, all this mechanistic evidence of what's not good, you have poor quality, uh, studies and all of this, that this pluralistic, uh, uh, what you call also um, uh, evidential pluralism, all this could lead people totally astray in some cases. And I think in, in the history of science, we can, we can find some examples of, uh, of that. Uh, some point is that maybe pluralism sometimes can be bad. I do you agree with that, or do you think it's always good? Um, and, um, and I'm thinking maybe that's the, my issue is more about the language. Maybe imperialism and war is not the best metaphor. And for example, also the reinforced concrete might also, because uh, I'm sure if we try to think of a concrete that is like evidential pluralism, then it's not just too right, and then it can be a huge mess, and then the building collapses because maybe it's not so good. Um, and so maybe a better metaphor, which I'm just suggesting, would be that you don't like the idea that some methods can have a regulating and dominating and some power uh, over another other methods. So I feel like the power imbalance and the domination uh, is what is the most problematic, and maybe not just the war situation. So say again what the metaphor would be in one... Uh... Uh, just Foreign idea as well. Uh, power imbalance, domination. Uh -huh. You know, I'm thinking because those are vocabulary that we have in political uh, mm -hmm. philosophy and stuff like that. So. so, yeah, my question is do you think pluralism is intrinsically good or is it most of the time good? Uh, and how do you think it's some, something a little bit more like freedom of method? I and mean, sometimes pluralism in political science is used as freedom. Yeah. So yeah, that would be my very, very general question. Uh, yeah. That's a big question, uh, Juliet. I so the um, I, I also dislike the the uh, the war metaphor, etc. And I was uh, borrowing the uh, imperialism from this literature, and especially Uskalimaki uh, working on uh, on this. Um, maybe there is something more nuanced to be said, uh, and also we could search for a better metaphor than just these two. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, what is really at stake is that, uh, for me, methodological, uh, methodological pluralism is not uh, just equal to freedom and uh, anarchy and anything goes, uh, and uh, the, the more the merrier, and it doesn't matter what... I, was, I didn't mean it like this, but like freedom, as if nobody is something that I don't want to do, like, which to me describes a little bit more the, the case study presented it. Yeah. The issue is not that people disagree, it's that they're trying to silence others. I think there is a, an element of trying to silence others or to uh, 
to impose uh, the uh, certain methods which may have uh, effects down the road of who uh, you hire in the department, who gets the grants. Uh, so I think that the, the, the stakes are not just uh, properly epistemological and what you are able to establish. They, they have a kind of spillover effects on the, the, the politics of, uh, of research and, and of academia. Okay. Now, even if uh, uh, you think in terms of uh, uh, how you would like to, to set up uh, a curriculum in your department and you have the whole department just teaching that line, that method. You know, uh, is it good that we expose students to just one area? You can do the same exercise, the same reflection for philosophy. Is it good that we have a department where only analytic philosophy is, is taught, for instance? Or do you have to give space to others, but then how do you build this uh, uh, pluralistic uh, approach? Do you have the means? Do you have the tools? So for me, this is where you, it is case by case that you decide whether it is fair enough that here it is a mono method or, or plurality of methods. But as a general take, I would say it is important that we have it, whether then we con make it concrete in different places or in the same, that is something that may depend on also on the capabilities of, uh, of the group that is carrying out uh, the, the research. Also, it may depend on the context because we may have important protocols. So now, clearly, it is important that in medicine we do use RCTs, uh, say, for drug approval. It's not that all of the sudden say, oh, a narrative is medicine is fantastic, so we will now take <laughs> to have the same weight uh, what patients say about what it felt uh, to, to, to use this drug uh, that is uh, in the experimental phase. Of course not, okay? But we may have to, to make this exercise of how we weight the evidence generated by this different method. Maybe we do get interesting uh, information from a narrative medicine approach that then may lead to do an extra run RCT to test other aspects of this uh, uh, drug. But if you just shut down the voice of the narrative medicine, basically you block the road for having this extra information. But then you quickly go into what is scientific and what is not, and so clearly it becomes another minefield. But I think as a general, general stance, I would like to argue that it is good. How good it is and how you implement it, then we have really to discuss depending on the, on the field, on the objective, uh, who is uh, potentially uh, benefiting or being harmed by this, and then we can see uh, how to implement it. Yeah. Uh, and then I have this uh, other question that is even more, more general. <laughs> but I was curious about that because, so the book, and uh, because this is. Am I allowed to say that you are, I have a forthcoming book? <laughs> <laughs> no, this has been by, it, it is out. Oh, it's out. It is out. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, the book, please have it. Um, <laughs> I didn't write. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's clearly for philosophy. Uh, uh, my impression is that it was clearly written for philosophers that know a little bit about what's up in the field. Um, but I feel like because a huge part of your argument is normative, uh, you also potentially talk to scientists themselves yeah. uh, in a very broad sense. Yeah. And so, and I know a lot of scientists, they would never understand uh, not just your book, but the, the main thesis, because there are so, so much the, the idea that you have one method is so much out there, uh, you know, just implicit, it, it, it's there in their mind. So, I guess it's a little bit of an unfair question. But, how would you approach, like, how would you uh, present your arguments on comparison to scientists uh, 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 as uh, compared to what you just presented and the way you do it in the book? Yeah. Another very good question, thank you. <laughs> no, I, 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 don't think it, I don't think it is an unfair question. I think it is a very relevant... Um, I think the short answer is to pick your battles, <laughs> because and also um, I think uh, the 
the question is uh, uh, try to find your allies. So I have been working, uh, I've been privileged to, to work with scientists that are uh, very philosophically minded. And so they, uh, I think they understood what I was trying to say about uh, this pluralistic approach, but also about other non-conventional philosophical ideas about uh, causation, etc. And then I've been working a lot lately with uh, scientists in this uh, mixed methods uh, uh, area. And they are pluralists, of course. And then uh, the, 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 I think the, the conversation really changes because the, the conversations we had were not about should we adopt a pluralism version 1 or version 1A, uh, 1B, 1 1 etc., but were about, for instance, how do you teach this? How do you train uh, students? How can you uh, help junior scholars making transitions from uh, domains that are really dominated by one uh, method. How do you become a multi-method uh, scholar? So honestly, I have no interest in convincing Miguel Hernan if he ever uh, reads my, my chapter, okay? But I am much more interested in working with those who are already trying in their area to promote forms of pluralism and see what can be done, especially to improve the methodology to be used uh, next. Mm. So I have actually a, a, a reply to this, because if the issue about some kind of science is that you have this imperialism <coughs> within science and, and, and the methods, I feel like uh, if we take the, compara the comparison, the metaphor about the far, uh, what we usually do to find this is like politi polit polit politics, and diplomacy and that kind of thing. And do you think that that would be a goal for you to do that uh, fight against imperialism? Or who do you think should do that? Scientists themselves? Like, I'm trying to take the metaphor yeah. very far, but I think it kind of makes sense that if they are imperialistic, uh, I mean, they are imperialistic methods in science, then it means that scientists have to be uh, activists in a way, on yeah. their own methods. I think you can uh, you can do that at different levels, and there are different areas uh, and the strategies that you may want to deploy may be very different. So you may think of how you can diversify a module that you teach. Uh, when I was editing the European Journal for Philosophy of Science with Phyllis Silari, we have been. Uh, when I was editing the European Journal for Philosophy of Science with Phyllis Silari, we have been uh, uh, trying hard to diversify the. Uh, the audience, one way we did it was having these subcategories that did not match always kind of the mainstream philosophy of science, also to give a signal to the community that we were welcoming papers in this area that was not previously recognized as such. Um, you may work with scientists who may know better how to promote these type of things in their own fields and uh, what it takes to have a key publication in a medical journal to argue for human health complexity and, uh, and this methodological pluralism. So there are different ways in which uh, you, you can uh, promote uh, this. Um, and they are different, and it's not that you have to be active in all of them. So you can also choose that... Uh, you know, going really to the front line with uh, these difficult publications with scientists is not your thing, but you teach a lot and, and therefore you try to do more in the teaching. Maybe you are super good uh, at uh, uh, with social media. I mean, go for it. Uh, if this is how you uh, you think you could, uh, you could promote it and explain it to a larger audience uh, what it is. Um, different, uh, different strategies there. Uh, so your answer is... Uh Methodological tourism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I'm interested in other people's questions, so it's okay. Um, yes, go ahead. As you wish. So the floor is open. I won't turn the, the camera towards you, following our tradition that you can protect your personal data. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Um, I have a, a double question about the um, philosophical parts. So your, your talk was very much a textbook example of most of this philosophy of science in practice, where people often make descriptive claims about science, and then they illustrate this with examples, 
or sometimes the examples are some kind of evidence. And so my, my first question is, um, what is actually the role of these examples? Like, if they're evidence, it's just one of the data points, which is and it's very big, so it's almost not in the prior to the whole work. But if it's not evidence, then what is it? That's the first question then related to that. Do you think that philosophy of science and practice maybe misses some of the um, some of the more quantitative work? So we have these these three kinds of practice terms in this in this in uh, philosophy of science. Um, there's actually a fourth one, the science of science one, where people do, do large scale research on science. And I often feel that philosophy of science and philosophy of science in practice really misses this perspective. Like there's lots of big and durable claims about science, like metallurgical pluralism is rampant and so on. But philosophers almost always use case studies um, towards your way of thinking about So you think that's the case should be more Work or and, um, what is actually the role of the case studies? Yeah. Very nice question, thank you. So to begin with, uh, I, I don't think I was using textbook uh, examples because uh, if you if you look at how textbook examples are used typically in philosophy of science, they are kind of the uh, typical uh, example from a science textbook. So in the literature on mechanisms, uh, the, the typical example is protein synthesis. So they oversimplify what this mechanism of protein synthesis is and then the reason around this. And that's not what I was uh, trying to do. Clearly what I presented here is uh, simplified uh, and pulling kind of the, the, the elements that were most interesting for me for the purpose of, of this uh, talk. I mean, sorry, I mean, yeah. in the meta sense that you give examples to illustrate broad claim about science. I agree that your examples are not so difficult to use. Like, in the meta philosophical yeah. sense, it's textbook because you use examples to illustrate or support a broad. Yeah. No, no, I think, I, I, okay, okay. So in that sense, yes, you can, you can consider them as a textbook because they, uh, in the book, uh, they, I use them at the same time as motivation and as illustration of philosophical claims. So it was a way of saying, um, the reason why I set up the questions in this way, it is because I see something in the practice of science. In fact, look at this, 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 and this. And then I do the philosophical analysis, I try to go in depth, and then I go back to the example and I analyze in more depth aspects of this, which is clearly not what I have done in, uh, in the talk, but that's what I was trying to do uh, in, uh, in the book. I chose uh, to look at uh, uh, five or six examples, I can't remember now exactly, from different areas because I was interested in making a pretty general claim in this case about methodological pluralism. But of course, you could decide that uh, in a different type of study, then you have one or two, and you go much more in depth. And this is where you draw the difference between this type of statistical analysis and how they have been really innovating or not in setting up this meeting in the middle methodology in molecular epidemiology. And so you can say other things that are also different in, uh, in scope. Okay, but here I was more interested in trying to establish a pretty general claim, and so I needed uh, more examples in less uh, depth. Okay, and it doesn't mean that I have put all in the talk uh, uh, or in the or in the in the book of what uh, my analysis was, but I was clearly making a selection of the relevant uh, elements. Your other point about these uh, quantitative uh, approaches to studying science, and I think you here you really mean scientometrics. I'm not sure why you don't consider it as part of science, philosophy of science in practice, because to me it is part of... Uh, I don't mean scientometrics. I mean, not just the bibliometric work. I mean, uh, so that's, that's one of the older fields, but there's this new trend. It's typically at this very high profile communication in science and nature. Really they do, but the, uh, how much do they reach um, uh, philosophical conclusions about science? Most of the time, they still make a kind of 
either descriptive claim, this is the trend now, or they make a prescriptive claims, this is where we have what we have to do, where we have to, to go. I, I think yeah. I agree. Some some of, some of my colleagues do. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Mattia Andreoletti in the philosophy of medicine has been using uh, and also doing a bit of himself uh, the, the, this kind of uh, quantitative uh, analysis to support his claims about evidence in medicine, blah, 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 more than I did. It is also a question of skills. I don't think I am able to do it, but I don't have an objection to using it. If anything, it really has an important complementary uh, role. Uh, so I see it. The fact that it's not in my analysis doesn't mean that uh, should not be used. <laughs> it wasn't exciting. I was just wondering that you think that the balance is only because of science, but there's lots of case studies and I think it is changing, you see, this way, because even when, I, if I think of when I started uh, doing philosophy of science, there was a lot of these proper textbook uh, examples or even toy examples and very little about uh, uh, the proper scientific cases unless you were doing history of science. And this has shifted gradually. Uh, whether you would like a, a, a quicker shift, um, I, I would be happy to hear your reasons for why we should be doing it more and more often. But the, but I do see it as uh, as in progress. Yeah, I think yeah. we make a lot of empirical claims for which we have no like, basic evidence. Yeah. <laughs> On the other end, it is exactly what you're trying to solve in your postdoc and in your team. Going to, <laughs> <laughs> you put your money where, where your mouth is. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Peter? that's all for a great talk. Uh, um, so I want to ask a question about individuation of methods and that's sort of more uh, um, a specific uh, uh, question. Um, so it seems to me that in, in many cases uh, it's not so clear what a method is. I doubt we can say that something is many methods or just one. Um, because you can also, if methods are consistent to some extent, uh, you cannot always sort of put them together and say, um, make it into sort of like a, a conjunctive method. Like if you want to reach that, that kind of conclusions, use that method. If you want to reach that kind of conclusions, I use that method, so if you like condition them on the purpose, uh, yep. and then the totality of things will no longer be thoroughly pluralistic, the combination of those methods, but just like one method that is not um, very unifying, but uh, does not um, cause the sort of um, trouble that uh, uh, methods that actually are uh, uh, disagree. I mean, the war metaphors don't work anymore once you have the situation where you have for this purpose that method and this purpose that method, yeah. so on. Um, <clears throat> so it seems to be relevant uh, to some extent uh, uh, into the kind of pluralism that one might consider as positive when they are not. Uh, uh, whether you want to get at a pluralism where there's fundamental uh, contradiction involved and uh, where a domain like not just uses different methods for different purposes but really says well these methods they really disagree uh, but we will uh, hire two people in our group uh, that both work out these tools they cannot talk to each other because then explosion or something um, but but, what, but, we, but the discussion among them is interesting, and so we, we let it uh, go on and so on. Uh, uh, but then, of course, there is not a big method uh, to be uh, seen uh, above the two specific methods that, because they contradict, you cannot call it, I guess. I mean, that's also part of the question, I guess. Uh, uh, whether you would then still be able to call that a bigger method, the one that includes the two that are thoroughly competitors for you know, like having uh, different opinions. Uh, so 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 and it, it relates also a little bit to the, to the case study you mentioned um, 
about this social research uh, where uh, there was disagreement about whether you should use the counterfactual method or not counterfactual counterfactual methods. But there was also the response like, yeah, but my purpose is different. I want to say something about this. So they could live happily together afterwards. So the response like, yeah, but my purpose is different. I want to say something about this. So they could live happily together afterwards. Uh, because they might agree that if they want to look for causes, better than methods, if they want to look for effects, better than methods. But like then they already have found a sort of uh, peaceful way of living together and constructing a science together. What I imagine in many cases, like there's the deep uh, disagreements that align these methods. Uh, so, so, so where, how do you like individuate what methods and um, and how does it affect pluralism? That's my question. Yes, Peter, I think you have actually two big questions in in here, and somehow I hear the logician in you <coughs> speaking about yeah, the, <laughs> the unavoidable. <laughs> so let me start with uh, the individuation of methods. So. Um, I guess this is uh, the, the warnings that Hawking's had uh, against uh, trying to pin down exactly what a method is. And you may want to be more or less precise depending on why you would need uh, this, uh, uh, this precision. So clearly, at the level of description that I gave about uh, uh, the, my cases today, uh, statistics and probability was uh, enough uh, to say that these are used uh, in molecular epidemiology and to some extent also in computational uh, history of ideas. But clearly, if you want to look at the details of what they have actually done, that it may matter whether they have used uh, statistical method X, statistical method Y, statistical method uh, Z, uh, or, uh, or whatever, okay? Um, and it may matter, and this is where I, uh, I get to the, the, the second part of, uh, of your uh, question, because, um, yes, if you I think we have to specify the purpose, because specifying the purpose is part of the justification of why statistical method X rather than statistical method Y. Okay, so in the quarrel that I was reporting about Gold, Goldthorp and Bucodi and the, the, the social earnings, blah, 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 uh, I think that the critique that they received was really, earnings, blah, 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 uh, I think that the critique that they received was really wrong. You know, they had specified the purpose and they had a good justification for why potential outcome was not the right method. Mm -hmm. Now, you could still have qualms about their method. You could say, in the range of observational statistical methods that you used, this one was better suited than this one. Your variable was not uh, well defined. Your data was not good enough. Uh, the, the theoretical framework that you used was not appropriate. And so basically, you shift where the, the disagreement is, uh, is about. And so clearly, I'm not for a happy family strategy where if we specify the purpose, then uh, we are just happy. But I want this to be um, a constructive uh, criticism that should also uh, help improve. It is clear that in that case, it was very much uh, uh, ideological, uh, if you want. And that's why I think it is uh, dangerous, uh, ill-suited, and, uh, and potentially uh, harmful, uh, in a sense. But it is not because... Um, um, so that's part of the thing. And then you have a point about uh, combining and unifying them, no? I don't think this is really going to happen precisely because they are fuzzy sets these methods. So you will not have a total uh, uh, unity. And also, some of these methods may shift. It is very interesting if you look at the history of statistics and see how, for instance, structural equation modeling, as we understand it now, really originates in path analysis that was used in some type of kind of genetics in the, uh, uh, in the, fir in the 30s. But some ideas remained, and some other things are totally different. Are they the same method, or are they very different uh, methods? I think I would like to hear from somebody like you whether it is very useful to have uh, 
a clean taxonomy of these things, or even a cladistic approach to see how they branched out and developed. For my purpose, this is not terribly useful. But for my purpose, maybe if you want to do history of methodology, maybe yes. Because then you could show how things have changed over time and how we went this way or another way, etc. Okay, so again, there the, the purpose of your philosophical question about methodology may determine how precise you want to be about defining these, uh, these yeah. methods. And I would like to hear from you what would be the interest in there. It was not in my approach, but it doesn't mean that there isn't another question for which it is useful. Thank you. She Thank asked you. you a question. Ah, well, if you want, if you have intuitions about that, I I would like to hear that, of course. I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So fair we enough. may have a project to write. Fair enough. <laughs> Other questions? So I can ask one during the time you think about. So it's a little bit related to to the question of, of Juliet, because if you buy that pluralism is is good. In the normative claims for all kind of reasons, you know, feminist studies or the, the, the kind of studies mm -hmm. you're doing, what will become of disciplinary matrix? So, because disciplinary matrix are quite important in formation, community building, identification of research, expertise. If we buy this pluralist, pluralist utopia, or for good reason, for normative reason, what? I have no idea how it will work. Um, I think you open uh, Pandora's box, uh, Alexander. But I, I, I think this is not the problem of the future. This is exactly the problem yeah, that we no. have uh, right now. Uh, because any one of us uh, working in an interdisciplinary and multi-method way, when we submit uh, a paper or a funding proposal, uh, these are uh, most of the time... Uh, organized by, by disciplines, and we have different, uh, different standards. Um, also for evaluation of research. Therefore, uh, a narrative CV in which you explain your achievement in a narrative way, because clearly any uh, quantitative assessment of your CV mm -hmm. may or may not make sense, uh, including the, uh, the role of uh, multi-authored uh, papers, for instance. Uh, so, I, I think we have a, we really have a problem. I, I don't see other solution right now other than listening to what it means to have a good result in philosophy of science or in medicine, and what is the role of uh, of that uh, in the uh, trajectory of the career you have uh, so far. Um, I, I I don't have a better answer other than that we have to discuss this. Uh, because it has very uh, important practical implications uh, when we evaluate other colleagues, uh, and especially. Yeah, and, and if I can no, no, push of you, course. and for for the authority of science, because if I could imagine someone that is arguing that it's such interdisciplinary that it cannot be evaluated by none of the of people, and yeah. this is pure new research, and you yeah. you don't have the means to evaluate the quality. Because you're from this discipline, this discipline, this discipline. Yeah. And it, it's already difficult among ourselves, people in academia, but from outside, I don't know how it will. But but we have to find a way because to... among, I suppose, that among multidisciplinary research, there's good ones and bad ones. But I suppose, I don't know. But... So I, I think here we, we may uh, try to work uh, on. Uh, different areas of cases uh, and how the answer may be different. So one conversation that I had uh, not long ago with uh, uh, colleagues uh, uh, with whom I'm working on this human health complexity approach, which is multi approach, which is multi-method in public health. And one problem that they had uh, was, uh, but my study is multidisciplinary. Then I tried to send it to a mainstream journal say in epidemiology and reviewers get back to me and they say, uh, I don't know to evaluate whether your results are valid because I am used to evaluate whether your RCT is good enough, okay? 
There, I think the answer is, from a philosophical perspective, we have to, to offer them other ways of assessing validity of studies that uh, encompass this uh, multidimensional uh, element. Okay, there, I don't think we had it ready yet, but I think I can point to the direction of where we have to, to go. So there is a lot of work for us philosophers of science to help them, not only in the production of this uh, uh, pluralist uh, approach in science, but also to the assessment. Now, you ask, how do we assess uh, colleagues? I have the sense that some of these achievements across fields should be able to be appreciated, especially from a person who is not from a disciplinary perspective. So I've been wondering, if I write a narrative CV to try and explain what I have done, it should not be the job of a peer colleague in a very specific field to evaluate that. Then should be really the project officer of the funding agency to establish whether I am on a path that could be useful and therefore merits, not for the, the, the object of the project, but at least for my capabilities. Okay, And so I wonder whether there is a different level of assessment that is, of course, not disciplinary and therefore does not have this kind of uh, uh, bias. Or if it does, then it takes a lot of work and of self-reflection of how you have to undo your uh, disciplinary idiosyncrasies and appreciate what the other person has done. How progress we have done in that direction? Very little, I think. So I, I, I think you, you have a big, uh, uh, a big point, which I want to take with me. Uh, and I think we should discuss it also from a philosophical perspective. I have a follow-up, but I will do it later. Oh, yeah. but we organize science by discipline and for discipline for the researcher, we're dividing discipline and also for the journal, so for the production, for the evaluation, the assessment of research. But the example of health was interesting. So, so you, maybe we should define now by subjects, by scientific objects or yeah. fields of inquiry and not divided by discipline yeah. independently of the field of inquiry. I don't know exactly how it could work, but I suppose that if you are already in this <coughs> health studies, you can evaluate more easily multidisciplinary health studies mm -hmm. than if you are from another, working on another subject. Yeah. But I don't know how we will cut the, the different scientific yeah. fields. Yeah. I think this is uh, the other big question of how this translates exactly in the organization of, uh, of research and of teaching, as, as you say. Uh, some institutes have made this uh, transition of uh, getting rid of uh, faculties by some disciplinary subject and going by problem, and then this translates in very different ways of, uh, uh, of teaching as well, and also to set up the, uh, the research. Uh, I wonder whether we need to keep a bit of both uh, after all, because uh, there is also something to be said about the value of a certain disciplinary specialism, because when you can really go deep into that, then you have something to offer from a multidisciplinary uh, perspective. So for me, maybe the point is not that we have to become all of a sudden all multidisciplinary, multi-method, etc., but we, we have to avoid the, the imperialistic attitude. And so kind of to recognize that there is also value in uh, the, uh, this, the specialized uh, approach if at some point it goes into dialogue with more uh, proper uh, multi-method, uh, multidisciplinary uh, approaches. And I have seen it with, uh, with students. Um, they have different types of qualities. Students that have been trained in philosophy from the bachelor, when they get to the master, they are super sharp. They are able to analyze uh, uh, problems in a certain way, craft an argument in a certain way, etc. And then societal relevance, very little. 
when I work with students who have been trained more in this uh, kind of liberal arts and uh, type of uh, uh, training, they are clearly less sharp at the philosophical level. They know much less about history of philosophy, but the way in which they are able to connect the philosophical questions to pressing questions of science, uh, science and policy, uh, science and society, it goes much quicker. Which one is best? Um, I think they both have, uh, have values. For one thing, you have to be clear about what kind of training do you offer and what they may get out of this uh, uh, training. And I'm not going to judge them by the same standards either. You see? So I, uh, again, uh, I think it is a very delicate conversation to, to have because it quickly uh, has these uh, spillover effects on any, anything else that we do in, uh, in the organization of the sciences. So yes. Yeah, I don't want to say something else. No, okay. So I have a question. If I'm a scientist and I want to avoid being an imperialist, like what can I do? Because sometimes you just see methods of which you think they're shit, and sometimes all of the people use those methods. Should we then not write the kind of paper that is equal in the example of those? Because clearly they must have had reasons for thinking that there was something wrong with those methods. I suppose the that when this happens, the reasons behind are not so much a scientific and methodological, there may be other types of uh, drivers uh, that are more political, uh, vested interest, and things like that. And this is where I think it gets uh, uh, very complicated. Um, in philosophy, we have this uh, tendency of uh, criticizing one another, and so it is also part of what we want to do, to publish a paper to show that uh, uh, also it is also part of what we want to do, to publish a paper to show that uh, uh, author X was wrong uh, in chapter of their book uh, in arguing for this, uh, and we, we take value in, uh, in this. I see this, uh, in a sense, less uh, in the, the science of trying to redress that. What has what happened more often instead is to criticize, say, a field for being methodologically uh, flawed, and often when they do it, the, uh, the problem is not so much the method itself, but it's other types of interests that, that come in. And that the, the question is not methodological anymore, it's really understanding what is going on the, behind, uh, behind the scene. Um, Can you separate these focus? I mean, I give you the perspective of the scientists themselves, they don't need quite a different reasons to decide that guy and write this paper. Faking that it's ecological issues, usually they actually believe that there is something wrong with those methods and they might be biased and so on. As a scientist, it's, it's hard to use your material to like, guide your action, asking how, how is it. No, you can't really separate them. I mean, you can to some extent. It is a conceptual exercise that you can make, but at some point uh, they again converge and are, they are intertwined. One good example that I have for this is. Uh, uh, regularly, the uh, IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, undergoes a heart attack, whether they, it is from epidemiologists who have uh, collaborations with uh, Big Pharma, for instance, or with other big uh, uh, companies in, uh, in the, you know, the, some chemical products. And then they have to defend themselves against these attacks. Sometimes these attacks happen in... Uh, in scientific journals. Uh, a few years ago, there was uh, this a series of papers uh, on uh, uh, epidemiology as junk science because they establish pretty much anything. Anything is correlated with anything else. Just pick the one you want and they, they will find data and the correlations that go in, in, uh, in all directions. And then uh, when I talked to uh, those who were kind of attacked and those they were trying to defend the field, I, it was not about science, it was about uh, the other connections. Uh, sometimes they do it in the, uh, in, in the open, 
Uh, another famous example is when uh, the IELC was uh, attacked after they, uh, they um, published the results of glyphosate. Uh, you know, and there again, they pitched as a problem of method, but the problem was not the method. See, so I wonder myself what is our role as philosophers in these uh, in these quarrels, and I guess this is why I take so much interest in the details about the methods. That's why I want to be able to make a difference between uh, defending uh, um, pluralism and yet being able to criticize a methodological approach uh, for uh, its own merit or uh, weaknesses, but making this distinct from you should only use potential outcome approach kind of thing. These are distinct. I think this is what I can do as a philosopher. Uh, I can learn from these quarrels that really get outside the, the, the scientific field uh, proper, and I can defend uh, the reasons why we should uh, um, not put everything in the same basket and when these distinctions matter. That's why I was interested in the question of Peter, because maybe there are moments in which we have really to, to split air and this is not the same as the other ones. And some moments where, no, we can put them as being part of the same. Um, I don't have a better answer than this. I know this is very disappointing. And, and I think the, the question you're asking is very relevant because it has to do with the... Just to add uh, your point about the difference between philosopher and scientist in, in conflicts and judgments, there's an interesting book by the Michel Lamont, sociologist of Harvard, called How Professor Think. And in all her graph, she said, professional philosopher are the exceptional philosopher are the exception in the scientific community. In all their studies of conflict discussion, philosopher are always the exception. Because, because philosophers are trained to be two philosophers in a committee will systematically argue against each other. Wow. Uh, two philosophers, of, we, we are trained to argue, yes. attack arguments, details arguments, not, and other discipline, they could have other ways to interact and discuss, and it's more. It's more, especially in multi in multidisciplinary committee when the judgment of different disciplines, but philosophers are our special cases, and it's empirically proven by Michel in her book. That's very interesting because I think this connects uh, uh, with the point uh, about epistemic uh, uh, diversity that I was trying to make uh, uh, at the end. It is true that philosophy. Uh, is this is what has been for a long time, especially the analytic uh, tradition. This is what we take a good paper of a student to be, whether they can make a sharp point like a, uh, tradition. This is what we take a good paper of a student to be, whether they can make a sharp point, etc. But you can also say that uh, this is something that we have to uh, unlearn as philosophers and to understand that what is the healthy way of disagreeing in a way that also advances the debate which is another Pandora box to open. I have a question from um, someone listening at home, but it's in French. Oh, no. Ça va. La transposition de la méthode de la physique considérée jadis comme la méthode unique permet de mieux analyser les données statistiques dans l'élaboration des modèles causaux qui sont aussi, aussi simples et prédictibles. Comment comprendre ce pluralisme méthodologique dans ce cas puisque l'économie expérimentale se trouve à l'aise dans l'emploi de cette, de cette transposition. L'économie expérimentale a transposé euh, ce qu'elle constate comme la méthode physique. Et donc, qu'est-ce qu'elle est, qu'en est, euh, qu est-il pour le, le, le pluralisme? Il y a une autre sous-question. Est-il une complexité interdisciplinaire ou devons-nous adopter un « anything goes » de Paul Feyerabend? Ah, no, no, definitely not. <laughs> no, so I am definitely not the anything goes. The, 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 for me, the idea of pluralism is clearly not that anything is, is, uh, is fine. I think it requires to justify why one method uh, over another, why it is justified to transpose methods from one field to another. I think that is uh, part of the, the question, especially the, the, the first part. The... Um, I think one would need then to go into the details of these methods and how they are used. And for me, there is always an element of uh, uh, multi 
uh, method implied because, uh, um, for instance, uh, those who argue strongly for quantitative methods, there is always an element of qualitative elements also in quantitative methods and the other way around. So I, I think the argument is really against the purity of uh, a method and instead understanding how these uh, intertwine. Um, I think I would need to go into the details of this transposition from one field to, to another to, to answer in more detail to this, uh, to this question, but it's not a way of uh, arguing for the anything goes, definitely. So not fair. No, no, <laughs> no. No. Peter? Peter. Yeah, I think it's a bit uh, a question of curiosity, uh, I guess. Um, so I, I'm wondering how you think, what you think about the, 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 the old fashioned uh, distinction between uh, context of discovery and context of uh, justification. Because um, in relation to pluralism specifically, because like uh, in the context of discovery, we are in general, much more open to be pluralists uh, because it's uh, um, we don't have to show it to the outside. Right? We, we do a certain research. Like I, I'm thinking of mathematicians uh, trying to come to a proof. They might uh, do a lot of uh, tests with the computer and do it quite kind of difficult. We need to see which theorem I hold, but then they cannot present this in a journal. Uh, I mean, unless they did it very thoroughly, but uh, that's not what the final product of the uh, set theorists or something wants to do. They will, they will, of course, give a deductive proof from reactions and so on and try to get at that. But in the, in the process of discovery, there was much more techniques maybe used, methods used, the scientific methods that are not necessarily the, the, the simply deductive yeah. uh, outcome of it. Um, and then there is some kind of, uh, to me, this seems to be a, a, a related to, uh, um, in relation to the normative aspect of what you, uh, what you said. Um, um, the, the imperialism works much better if it's about the products you, you, you produce, you know, the, the way you justify stuff. They can attack you on that. It's much more difficult to attack um, discovery methods um, if the, the end product is justified in all the ways that society uh, that is in power accepts uh, what is behind it. Uh, is hidden, so uh, you, there's more freedom there. Um, like, does, does that mean that maybe we should break open this, this distinction if it still exists, if it makes sense at all? Um, uh, or um, is it a matter of being more explicit about discovery methods used and, uh, um, and, and then maybe be less hypocritical about uh, uh, what you actually did? Like, in the case of the code, the, 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 the the, the control trials. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of other things going on that you mm -hmm. just don't present yeah. that way because I want to get into a very convincing paper. Um, so, so where do you see the importance of the distinction? Uh, it's a very open question. Yeah, thank you. So I think it is interesting that you bring up mathematics as an example, and I'm going to come back to mathematics in a moment. Um, the distinction is not uh, uh, endorsed uh, at the moment, and it hasn't been uh, for the past no, no, no. couple of. The distinction is not uh, uh, endorsed uh, uh, at the moment, and it hasn't been uh, for the past no, no, no. couple of. I think it is interesting to go back to the distinction because when it was proposed, the idea was, uh, as philosophers of science, we can properly talk about. Uh, justification, but not about uh, discovery, because in the discovery there are all these uh, kind of human uh, unpredictable elements, and this is not uh, for um, the, the reconstruction of this universal logic of science, blah, 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 Hempel kind of thing, right? Now, if you take this uh, practice uh, shift uh, uh, properly, kind of seriously, this is one way in which you could see that this distinction is blurred, because uh, uh, from the perspective of Hazok Chang, it does matter how they came to understand what temperature is, also analyzing who these scientists were. So maybe we will never exactly understand what was this haha -ha moment of whoever had the brilliant idea of making that experiment in that moment, but still you can pin down some epistemic material uh, conditions uh, that were part of this discourse. But in many of the cases that I look at, um, maybe 
artificially you can separate, oh, this is more about discovery and this is more about justification, but in fact it is much more iterative uh, and, uh, uh, and intertwined than we, we, we tend to think. So a very good example here is um, the very first randomized control trial in, in Britain, the one on streptomycin, <coughs> is uh, sometimes used to show that uh, um, this, what they, were, what they wanted to prove was in fact also a moment of learning because they stopped it and patients developed again pneumonia, blah, blah, blah. And so they learned about time lapse that they should observe before stopping the trial, you know? So it is clearly the randomized control trial is a moment of justification and yet in the process, you learn a lot if you observe how the, 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 the trial unfolds, okay? And this happens kind of uh, all the time. So again, what is the use of uh, making this distinction neat and clean? It may in some cases, for instance, if you want to, to establish what kind of background knowledge was available at that time and what was not, but in general, they are really more intertwined than... Uh, then we, we tend to think with a naive way of, of looking at science. That's why I see value in uh, having this practice approach. And this is why I, I now go back to your example of mathematics. And this is really a field I know little about. But I, what I know is that those who are looking at mathematics from a practice perspective, at some point, they get much closer to understanding mathematics as many other fields than what we have now. Typically, philosophy of mathematics is this apart thing in the, in the philosophy of science because mathematics works differently. But I would like, I don't know, science because mathematics works differently. But I would like, I don't know, but I would, typically this is what okay, it is. is. Okay, I, I don't yeah. That yeah, okay. but that's why I think, I wonder whether your reconstruction at some point may get a different narrative if we do it from a practice perspective and not from the perspective of this is the theorem, this is the proof. Uh, so from the perspective of the object rather than from the perspective of the agent performing it. Question mark. And I would be curious to see what the answer is. So the old researcher, Takala, is there a question of... Uh our two master students because you know Federica is here she's ready to engage <laughs> it's almost the end uh, in broad, in broad is it any difference between doing any boundaries between doing philosophy of science and science or philosophy I have problem to, to distinguish you as a philosopher or as a scientist uh... Excellent question. That's a good one. <laughs> so for a long time, and this goes to the point of, of Alexander before, so I was not scientific enough to be a scientist. I was not philosophical enough to be a proper philosopher. Um, now, I, 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 it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter. I, I think that we can say what a philosophical question is uh, quite distinctively and also say uh, why it is relevant for the, the, the practice. Who does it? To me, it is less relevant. But of course it is relevant for more junior people that have to publish and get a job. <laughs> You see, and so this goes back to the question of, of Alexander, really. So my advice to the more junior people at the moment is that um, if you need to get a job, Publish your three papers that will get you a job in a field and then do your multidisciplinary stuff. And then it doesn't matter whether you are more scientist, more philosopher, uh, etc. So if you, uh, if you have a clear target, then you can try and, uh, and, and present your profile as being part of that box because this is how we we judge people, but then maybe at some point it doesn't matter. To me, it doesn't matter anymore. So I'm very happy when I have these collaborations with the scientists and I am able to make my philosophy relevant to them. Am I still a philosopher or am I a scientist? I, um, to me, it's not, it's not the, the point, but I do understand why it may matter to, uh, to you. And it is a conversation that you need to have, not because it has to define essentially 
who you are, but because it may have a kind of effects uh, later on, and so you may want to be more strategic than I have been in the past, <laughs> smarter, <laughs> just to say it bluntly. <laughs> Last question. It's the call of the sun and the traditional beer after the cinema. <laughs> so let's thank our, our speaker. Thank you.